any religion that takes advantage of the sick and the poor and the weak comes under divine judgment. Well, all of that leads me to the star of the day, Joel Osteen. <laughs> I regret that he has replaced me on Larry King. It drives me completely nuts. <laughs> Mike Horton in Christless Christianity, page 68, said, uh, Osteen has achieved the dubious success of making the name it and claim it teaching of Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn mainstream. There's some truth in that, absolutely. Pat Robertson commends Joel Osteen. Of all people, Max Lucado, the largest selling Christian author, commends Joel Osteen. Ed Young Jr. commends Joel Osteen, Southern Baptist pastor, Dallas. That's pretty mainstream. Let me see if I can set the record straight. Joel Osteen is a pagan religionist, a legalist, and a quasi-pantheist. I'm not done. This is my pulpit. I can be here as long as I want. Now, on the other side of that, Jesus Christ is a footnote to satisfy his critics, thrown in at the end to get people off his back who are irritated by the absence of Christ in his ministry. And what is he saying? What is his message? We save ourselves from all the things we don't want, all the things that are wrong in our lives, by our own internal divine faith power. That's his whole operation. In his book, Your Best Life Now, and by the way, I want to hasten to say he's absolutely right. If you believe in what he says in that book, this will be your best life. <laughs> It'll be a whole lot better than the next one. He is absolutely right. If, but if you want your best life now, go for his theology. If you want your best life forever, avoid it. What does he say in your best life now? He says that um, we are able to create by our faith and our words the dreams we dream and the desires we have. Health, wealth, happiness, success, all the same old, same old temporal things. Quote, if you develop an image of success, an image of health and abundance and joy and peace and happiness, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. End quote. Here's another one. All of us are born for earthly greatness. You were born to win. You were born to be a champion. Tell that to the 20 handicapper. God wants you to live in abundance. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. Before we were formed, he prepared us to live abundant lives, to be happy, healthy, <clears throat> and whole. But when our thinking becomes contaminated, it is no longer in line with God's word. By the way, when he says God's word, he's not talking about the Bible. He's talking about what you believe to be intuitively the voice of God talking to you, telling you what you ought to be creating your wish list. Get your thinking positive, he says, and he'll bring your desires to pass. He regards you as a strong, courageous, successful person. You are on your way to a new level of glory. Now, how do you do this? Here is his list. Believe, visualize, speak out loud. Same list. You got to know what you want, believe it, visualize it, speak it out loud. Out loud. Your words literally release this life giving power. Here's some more quotes. Friend, there's a miracle in your mouth. Isaiah might have a problem with that as I think about it. 
Here's Joel Osteen's prayer. I thank you, Father. This is his own prayer. I thank you, Father, that I have your favor. Does that sound familiar? Luke 18. I thank you, Father, that I'm not like other men, even like that publican. Here's another quote. I, I know these principles are true because they work for me and my wife. Of course, you're at the top of the Ponzi pile. Everybody's sending you their money. <laughs> and then he says, how do I know they work? Because I found a perfect parking spot at the mall. That's deep. What about the poor little old lady that was waiting behind you for that parking spot? Anymore? Now, the good news is that all of this has some theology behind it, some theology proper. He says, God has already done everything he's going to do. The ball is in your court. This seems to me like hyper Pelagianism. Pelagianism on steroids. Well, at this point, I think we've heard enough to recognize the real source of his religion. Are you having trouble with that? He is a mouthpiece for Satan. He is an agent for Satan. How do I know that? Because he offers all the things that the unregenerate heart already wants. 1 John 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is of the world and is passing away. That's Satan's strategy. Think about it. In Matthew 4 and Luke 4, when our, our Lord was being tempted by the devil, what did he do? He appealed to the desires of the Lord's heart apart at the moment, from, apart from the, the will of God for the moment. You shouldn't be hungry. You should be full. You shouldn't be rejected. You should be accepted. You shouldn't be insignificant. You should rule the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you everything that you want. And every time he answered with scripture, right? It's not the first time, nor the last time, nor any isolated situation where somebody parades himself as a minister of Jesus Christ who is in fact a minister of Satan, because we know from Paul's letter to the Corinthians that the devil himself is an angel of light and his agents are disguised the same way, right? Why, why are these people so successful? Be, because Satan is behind the enterprise and he is appealing to that which is the natural desire of the unregenerate heart. Everything the unconverted sinner wants is what these people are offering in the name of Jesus Christ. This is a false Christianity from hell. All of Satan's temptations are driven at fallen corruption, selfishness, pride. Indulgence. In the system, there is no biblical understanding of God. There is no biblical understanding of man. And certainly there's no biblical understanding of sin. If we were to talk about the, the doctrine of total depravity for a, a moment, you could understand it simply as man's universal inability and unwillingness to come to God. He is both unable and unwilling. No man seeks after God, nor does any man have any capacity to come to God. He is both unable and unwilling. He has no interest in God. He is far more interested in what Satan can give him in this life, right? That's why all of this appeals. All men are both unwilling and unable to offer anything worthy to God that could in any sense please God or cause God to bless them. This notion that you have so much goodness in yourself that you can literally speak your desires out and God somehow jumps out of the little genie lamp and gives you everything that you desire because you're such a noble person created to be a winner and a champion is a lie right out of hell. The movement 
doesn't understand depravity. And that's where all understanding of the doctrines of grace have to start. The doctrine of total depravity, the inability and unwillingness of anyone to come to God, is the most attacked doctrine, either on purpose or ignorantly. The most attacked doctrine is the doctrine that says man can do nothing. Because every other religion in the world except true Christianity says man can and must do something. There are only two religions in the world. Divine accomplishment and human achievement. Divine accomplishment is true biblical Christianity. Every other religion is some form of human achievement. The most attacked doctrine, and we heard it, it was attacked and continues to be attacked by those people who are in the progeny of, of Finney and others. The idea that man is dead, blind, helpless, hopeless, that he's an eternal loser is something that men don't want to acknowledge. It is, however, the most distinctively Christian doctrine because if it is true that, that only the gospel is the truth, this is foundational to the gospel. It is the one area where you're going to find a truly distinctive view of man as totally depraved. It is the most contrary Christian doctrine as well. Because it goes against the grain of the dominant human internal feature, and that is self-justification, self-defense, and pride. Men do not want to recognize they are bad to the bone, that they are corrupt to the bottom, that they are incurably hostile to God and good, that they are self-centered fatally, that they are self-deceived, they are superficially willing to acknowledge uh, their sins, they are sinners in their sins, they will admit that, but they will not see themselves as sinners in their goodness, and they will not see themselves as sinners in their religion. Their thoughts about God, they don't believe to be sinful but noble. False religion then becomes the most deceiving and the most heinous of all sins, and is, of course, a violation of the first and great Commandment. Religion doesn't cancel out the doctrine of total depravity, it proves it. Preachers like Joel Osteen and others must, I think, hate the true God. They wouldn't say that. I think they hate the true God. I think they hate the true Christ. That's why they mask the true God. That's why they hide the true Christ from the eyes of their followers. And they put in his place an idol of their own making. I can't think of anything worse than that. According to Scripture, the Lord does not offer sinners what already enslaves them, their own lusts and desires. The Lord offers the sinner the gospel and with it the hope of being rescued from what enslaves them. The gospel calls the sinner to flee, deny self, run from judgment, die to all that is in the world, escape hell gain heaven. In the self-God movement, you, you change your own life. You don't need God. You don't need Christ. You don't need the cross. You've got the power in you to do it all. In the book, Your Best Life Now, Osteen says, God wants this to be the best time of your life. Happy, successful, fulfilled individuals have learned how to live their best life now. As you put the principles found in these pages to work today, you will begin living your best life now. If that doesn't sound like Satan, I don't know what does. That's what the devil would say. This is your best life now. Does that sound like eat, drink, and what? Be merry, this is it. By the way, there's no mention of Christ in that book. It's not part of that. Satan offers sin's pleasures for a season. But if you're a child of God, forgiven and headed for heaven, this life is not your best. This is good. This is not our best. 
In fact, I don't even want to invest too much hope in what this life can be. Do you? It is pretty disappointing. And I've, I've, I've experienced the best of it. But the older I get, the larger the accumulation of disappointments becomes. People say to me sometimes, you're not as funny as you used to be. <laughs> and my answer is, life isn't as funny as it used to be. Of course I was funny when I was 18. Everything was funny when I was 18. It was pretty funny when I was 25. Not so funny now. And it's not because of what goes on at a distance. It's, what because, it's, what, it's because of what I've experienced in my life. This is not my best life now. My best life is to come. And I want to take you to a text of scripture. I really do. And I'm going to do it right now. First Peter one. And of course, I, I had the resurrection on my mind preparing for uh, next week. This this passage is such a, a wonderful passage. First Peter one, three through five. I want to turn the corner. Forget what we've heard up to this point and look at a text of scripture that puts our focus where it needs to be. For those who are truly the children of God in Christ, this is the worst we will ever know. This is the worst we will ever experience. Our best life is to come when this life is over. And um, whatever this life is, it's not worthy to be compared, right? That's why the, the Apostle Paul says, we, we look for that which is to come. I love that whole section in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and on into chapter 5 where he celebrates the life to come. But so does Peter. Let me read these verses. This is, a, this is essentially a doxology at the outset of his epistle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, you know where we're going, right? Peter is writing to some scattered believers. They are aliens, and they are identified as aliens in the very outset of this chapter to those who reside as aliens scattered, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. So they are the elect who are scattered. They are strangers in the world. They are clearly under persecution that comes out all through the epistle chapter 2 verse 20 what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated you endure it with patience but if when you do what is right and suffer for it you patiently endure it this finds favor with God for you have been called for this purpose called to suffer for righteousness sake and that becomes a theme Throughout this epistle, chapter 3, verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And he repeats the same thing in chapter 4. And then he culminates his uh, look at that in 510. After you have suffered a while, the Lord make you perfect. So he's writing to some harassed, hated, abused, intimidated, troubled, elect who are out of their normal environment, living in very grave difficulty and having their lives on the line. He doesn't say to them, by the way, if you can just somehow find the inner power in you to visualize a better life, you can create your world the way you want it to be. That is ludicrous. He calls rather for a doxology. He calls on them to lift up their hearts in praise, jubilant praise, jubilant worship of God who has promised them eternal joy, eternal blessing. He is calling on them and calling on us to adore God now for the life to come. Now the doxology centers on one great reality and it's in the beginning of verse four. Let's just notice 
the phrase to obtain an inheritance. And in the original, the verb isn't there. He is focusing on our inheritance. The word means essentially a fully realized and possessed gift. It doesn't refer to the title of something, but the actuality of it. You have an inheritance. It is an already possessed inheritance. He is calling on these troubled believers living their worst life now to suffer patiently, to suffer unto maturity or perfection, to wait with hearts full of exuberant praise for the eternal inheritance that the Lord has promised them, the inheritance that Christ has purchased for them. And this is a call for exuberant joy, songs of joy in the night of despair. In this, our worst life, we are the children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, and we live in hope of an unimaginable and eternal inheritance. We're like a, I don't know, like a childish prince who is the possessor of, of the kingdom because the king has died but until he becomes mature he will not be able to grasp the enormity of his inheritance we have only a little understanding like children of the great eternal king we have no real full comprehension of what we will receive in God's time too much expectation in the present will steal that joy. Sometimes when we're talking to pastors, we talk about ministerial burnout. And some people have suggested that this is a problem of um, disappointment with people. This is a problem because some pastors are beleaguered because of the way they're treated. And my assessment of ministerial burnout Weariness in well-doing is not so much related to what people do to you as it is related to what you expect them to do to you. And the lower your expectations, the less likely you are to be disappointed. And if you understand at the very beginning that you are a clay pot, that helps. Second Corinthians 4, we are an earthen vessel. And in case you were wondering about that, to, to compare that with what Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, in a house there are vessels of gold and silver, valuable, and then there are those of wood and clay, and there are the, the gold and silver are vessels unto honor, that's what you serve the food with, and the ones of wood and clay are unto dishonor. It isn't that they are just limited in their use, they are used for dishonorable purposes. The good stuff puts the food in, the bad stuff takes the results out. You understand? <laughs> this is a pre-plumbing world. I want to help you with this. And when the Apostle Paul is trying to identify what he is, he doesn't say, I'm a gold plate or a silver plate. He says, I'm a garbage bucket. Now, with that kind of expectation, you're very unlikely to be severely disappointed if things don't go well. <laughs> By the way, that's what was said of Luther. He was a privy pot. And he probably would have agreed. You just don't want to invest too much into this life of expectation. This is not your best life now. But if you want to make the most out of it, understand that. And don't fool yourself into some idiocy of thinking that by visualization and some faith energy in you, you can recreate your world or you're going to crash and burn seriously. And please stop sending money to the people at the top of that scheme. If you're doing that, Paul says in Ephesians 1:18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance. 
Paul says, look, I'm not telling you you should look for anything here. You need to look for everything in the life to come. I want you to get a grip on what is waiting you. What is this inheritance tied to? It is an inheritance, if you'll jump down to verse 5, that is described as a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I think we all understand there are three dimensions to salvation, right? We have been saved from the penalty of sin by the work of justification at the point of faith and regeneration. We are being saved from the power of sin through the process of sanctification by the Spirit of God through the Word. We will one day be saved from the presence of sin through glorification. We understand the full range of salvation so that we understand what it means when it says it's a salvation ready to be revealed, fully disclosed only at the last time right we haven't yet entered into the fullness we are nearer Paul says than when we first believed but we haven't arrived yet nonetheless what we want to do is keep our focus our eyes the eyes of our hearts on that final glory the riches of the glory of his inheritance what will that mean you hear all kinds of things when you talk to people about heaven. Some people say, I don't know what heaven will be like. I'd get kind of bored after a while. I don't know what we'll do up there. If we play a game, everyone will win. Everyone knows. <laughs> I can't show up at a party and tell something that nobody's heard. I can't explain something that nobody knows. What, am, what are we going to do? It sounds boring. And, and I've heard people say, well, I... I, uh, I think when we get there, we're going to be surprised uh, who's not there and who's there. And my response to that is, I, I don't think that's going to be the issue. I think when we get there, we're going to su be surprised that we're there. <laughs> I'm going to be shocked. How, how did this happen? Grace beyond comprehension. But what does it mean to go to heaven? It, it, when people ask me what is attractive about heaven, I, I, I'm okay with the pearls for gates and, you know, cubed city of the new Jerusalem, layers of transparent gold and all of those kinds of things. But what appeals to me about heaven most is the absence of the curse, the absence of sin, the absence of decay, all the effects of fallenness and corruption, the absence of conflict, pain, suffering, sorrow, tears, discipline, hatred, misunderstanding, weakness, failure, all of that. I can only describe heaven in terms of negatives because I don't know what the positive description of the absence of those things would be except perfect holiness and perfect joy, limitless joy, limitless holiness, unbounded peace, ready to be revealed in the last time. Paul comes to the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4. You know, he's had a really difficult time. People have been abandoning him, right? He says there, in my first defense, no one stood with me. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Everybody who was converted, uh, you know, in the Gentile world was somehow related back to Paul. And he actually says to Timothy, all who are in Asia Minor have forsaken me, except the house of Onesiphorus. And then he says, no one stood by me at my first defense. But in 2 Timothy 4.18, he says, the Lord will rescue me from evil and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. That has to be our perspective. Our inheritance is a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time, the final epoch. For us, it's death or the triumphant, glorious return of Christ. This is cause for praise. And so we go back to the beginning of verse 3. Blessed be, and on he goes in this wonderful doxology. Let's look at it a little more closely. Blessed be God. That's a very Jewish expression. Blessed be God. 
I think of Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, or Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. This was a very common expression the Jews gave in introducing their worship. But there are some components that then break out of that beginning. Blessed be, and now I want to show you a handful of, of points here, just so you can hang your thoughts on these hooks. We read about the source of our inheritance. We, we offer this praise because of our inheritance. Let's break it down to the source, the motive, the means, the nature, the duration, and even the guarantee of our inheritance. The source of our inheritance Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God is known as the Creator. God is known as the Redeemer of Israel. He is known as the God and Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now, God is to be known as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a repeated Designation of God through the New Testament epistles, in particular Ephesians, Corinthians, and even in Hebrews, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What it's saying is God is the God who is one with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is essentially an expression that follows up John 10, 29, I and the Father are one. The God we worship is the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you do not worship the true and living God unless you identify him as one with Christ. This is the true God who is one with Christ. Some of the students from the Master's College went on a spring break trip to um, Salt Lake City to do some witnessing to Mormons. And uh, they were at the Mormon temple. And the, uh, the counter... Uh, the counter to these witnessing young people were some agents of Mormonism who came out and they were distributing papers uh, on their supposed theology. And there were papers uh, exalting Christ as Savior. Frighteningly, our students took a look at these papers a couple weeks ago and they had quotes by John MacArthur laid out on the front. Now, what you have to know is they didn't know they were students from our college. This is the standard issue material that they distribute in front of the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. Now, I met in this church with the leaders, the main writer, Robert Millet, who writes their theology, which you don't have a lot of opinions in their theology because you have these nine guys that decide everything is true. But he writes it all. And we sat for hours. And the conclusion we came to is you have a different God. You have a different Christ, you have a different gospel, but other than that, <laughs> the God of the Bible is a created being, the Christ of the Bible is a created being, the spirit of the Bible is a created being, and Jesus is not the, is not the same as the ultimate God, he's a created being. Well. The source of our inheritance, by the way, is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be that God who has provided this inheritance. That again talks about source. It's not the result of our desire. We didn't activate it. We didn't generate it. We didn't make it happen. It came from God. We understand that as sovereign salvation. Why did he do it? What's the motive? Who, according to his rich Mercy, Elias, according to his rich mercy. This is such a wonderful word. This word refers to someone who is so pitiful and so helpless in such horrible condition that he has no hope. Matthew 17, 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, said the man. Blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What could a father do about a lunatic son who kept throwing himself into a fire? What could Bartimaeus do about his blindness? What can the sinner do about his sin? The other one in Luke 18 is pounding his chest. The publican saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's the one that went home justified. And of course, Micah 718 says, God delights in mercy. His mercy, Psalm 108 says, is far above the heavens. He is called the father of mercies, and his mercies, says Jeremiah, are new 
every morning. In that great second chapter of Ephesians, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, he made us alive in Christ, with Christ. The source then of our eternal inheritance is God himself. The motive is mercy. And the only response we can have to mercy is to give him glory, right? Give him praise. We make no contribution to the extension of mercy. What is the means of this inheritance? The means is given here as well. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. Literally in the Greek, anagenesis, having regenerated us. Again, this is a divine work. We were regenerated by the power of God. God regenerates the dead soul. Back to Ephesians. You were dead in trespasses and sins. I love the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. <clears throat> because Nicodemus says, what do I need to do to be born again? Now, he understands that this is an analogical discussion with spiritual realities in view. He's not stupid. He knows he's talking to the teacher in Israel. And when Jesus says to him... You, 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 you need to be born again. He knows he's not talking about going back and re, being reborn. But he speaks back in analogies. How, how do I do this? How can I be born again? That is such a basic question. How, how, do, I, how do I do that? And Jesus says this. Well, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. But as far as how you do that, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. Don't know where it comes from, where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. What? What is his answer? His answer is you can't do anything. Any more than you can control the wind. You can't control the Holy Spirit. But you have been, if you are born again, regenerated by the power of God and the will of God and the purpose of God. How does it happen, though? Isn't there a context in which it happens? Yes. First Peter 1, 20 to 23, you're begotten again by the word of truth. The hearing of the gospel, as we heard from Mike earlier. Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ, the hearing of the gospel. And at that moment, the marvelous regenerating power of the spirit of God, because he wills to do it, gives us life. And this is the means that produces in us a living hope. That is a hope that never dies. We're not like all men most miserable because we have a hope that dies. Look, all the hope you have in this world will die. All the people who follow Joel Osteen, either they never get what they wish, which is 99% of the time, and if they happen to be high enough up the pile that they do get what they wish, eventually it is gone. If it's all in this world, if all your hope is here, it will die. If it hasn't died, it will die. But we have a hope that will not die, a living hope given to us because we have been given life, regenerated. We now have eternal life. And for us to die is merely gain to enter into the fullness of that life. The source is God. The motive is mercy. The means is regeneration. And then just a word about the nature of our inheritance, the nature of it. Look at verse four. It is imperishable, undefiled. And will not fade away. I, if I had time, could go through those words. It's enough to say imperishable means exactly what it says. Undefiled means exactly what it says. Unpolluted, unstained, will not fade away. That is, it's not subject to decay. That word would be used to describe uh, flowers that fade and decay. This inheritance that we're waiting for never dies. We have a living hope in a living inheritance, never diminishes, never loses its supernatural glory. For how long? The duration of it? Fifth thought? Well, the duration of it is forever. It is reserved in heaven for you. 
It's reserved for you in heaven, safely in the eternal place. Heaven will never be invaded. Its treasure will never be plundered, laid waste, defaced, or stolen. Jesus said it this way, if you lay up your treasure in heaven, it'll never what? Rust. Thieves will never steal it. And you will, by the way, never be disqualified because your inheritance, verse 5, and you along with it are protected by the power of God through faith. The faith that he gives you to believe is a permanent faith, not a temporary faith. This is the perseverance of the saints, the security of the believer. The doctrines of grace just pour through this wonderful, wonderful text. Well, we have all of that, this glorious inheritance with all of these components laid out for us in this doxology. What is the guarantee? The guarantee at the end of verse 3. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The cross is validated in the resurrection. The stupendous historical event opens heaven to all the elect. Fixes their inheritance and their eternal joy. This is provided for us through the cross and validated in the resurrection. Scripture repeatedly says God raised Jesus from the dead and in raising him up secured the inheritance of all who died in him and rose in him. The lie is that this is your best life now. This isn't it. We just saw what it is, and it's the life to come. And the longer I live and the older I get, the sweeter this becomes to me. My faith gets stronger as the years go by because, as he says in a little later in that same section, every time faith is tested and survived, you know you have a supernatural faith. That's what testing your faith does. Somebody said to me today, you know, so-and-so is struggling with assurance of salvation. And I said, well, that's probably because that person hasn't had enough tests. Why? Rejoice, verse 6 says, for a little while, while if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what you want out of this life? You want trials and you want suffering because when you come through the other side and you know your faith is intact, the gift of God to you is assurance. That your faith is the real thing. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together in this passage and just lightly touch the surface of this. We don't hesitate to, to name names and speak of those who are a danger to the cause of Christ and to the reception of the kingdom in this time and place. We... We know that Scripture warns against false teachers and names them as well. And Lord, we just, we ask you to exalt those that are faithful. Exalt the truth, Lord. And bring down error. Make it clear. We thank you for the gift that you've given to us in giving us the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes discernment. We have been delivered from error to the truth, as Paul put it in Romans. Thank you for these days of fellowship and learning and days of enhanced and enriched worship and praise. For that comes out of deeper knowledge of the truth. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. So fill us with the truth that our worship may be informed. The more we know about you, the more praise will rise from our hearts to your glory. That's our prayer, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.